Good morning, and welcome to the meeting of the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises. I'm Council Member Francisco Moya, the Chairperson of the Subcommittee. Uh, today we are joined by Council Member uh, If you are here to testify, uh, please fill out a speaker slip with the Sergeant at Arms indicating your full name, the application name, or the LU number, and whether you're in favor or against the proposal. Today we are holding a hearing on LU's 529, an application by the uh, Precanus LLC, uh, Lola Taverna, for an application request approval for a uh, revocable consent to operate an unenclosed sidewalk cafe, including 24 tables and 48 chairs to be located at uh, 210 Sixth Avenue in Manhattan in Speaker Johnson's district. Uh, I now open the public hearing on this application. Today, uh, I will read a letter from the Speaker's office relating to this application. The community surrounding Lola Taverna, located on 2010 Sixth Avenue, has reached out to me to express their concerns about the potential impact to pedestrians and local residents relative to a revocable consent for a new unenclosed sidewalk cafe at this location. My district office has received over 100 emails in support of uh, Manhattan Community Board 2's resolution requesting a modification of this sidewalks uh, of the sidewalk cafe application from 24 tables and 48 chairs to 16 tables and 32 chairs while i believe that a new greek restaurant with outdoor seating could be a positive addition to the neighborhood this particular applicant's record on quality of life issues at little prince a restaurant that he operates at 199 prince street less than one block from this proposed new cafe location has not been indicative of the necessary respect towards the surrounding community. For example, within a five-month period this year between March 31st and August 30th, the applicant received 15 loud music and noise, noise complaints at Little Prince. Frequent loud music complaints submitted to 311 have also been logged through the prior two years. In addition, and just as importantly, sidewalk, sidewalk safety and congestion at the location of the previous revocable consent are critical considerations. The residents who live in and walk these blocks every day believe that pedestrian foot traffic would be significantly impeded by the 48 chairs and 24 tables requested by this proposal. Furthermore, the applicant indicated that he would request only 32 chairs when he went before Community Board 2's SLA licensing committee in October 2018. The community relied in part on that statement when it voted to approve the liquor license. The communication of information has been misleading and confusing at best, and at worst promotes doubt and frustration amongst residents who already have concerns about these quality of life issues. No private entity has the automatic right to use the public sidewalk for private gain. Use of the public way is a privilege extended to businesses at the city's discretion. A properly run sidewalk cafe can be an asset to a community, benefiting operators, patrons, and residents. If the applicant were to demonstrate that he could operate a new 32-seat cafe as a good neighbor for a period of time that includes the summer months, the council could consider a future application for 48 seats at this location pursuant to a new application. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to comment that on this application, and that was from uh, Council Speaker Johnson. I will now call up the first panel. Steve Wagunda. Good morning. Please raise your right hand and state your name for the record. My name is Steve Wygoda. I'm an architect. 
Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and you'll answer all questions truthfully? I do. Thank you. So my name is Steve Wygoda. I'm the architect for this application. Uh, we, my firm, SWA Architecture, has uh, worked on over a thousand locations in New York City over the years, and um, this is um, this location is one of many that we've um, tried to negotiate um, on behalf of uh, all parties. Um, so I have a letter that was signed by the owner. He is not here. Um, and if I may uh, read the letter into the record. Yes? Okay. So the letter is dated today, October 3rd, 2019, City Council Member Corey Johnson. Um, regarding the Sidewalk Cafe Agreement letter for the uh, Prince Capas LLC. And the letter goes, Dear Council Member Johnson, we respectfully submit this letter to the City Council. Please note the following items. Number one, Prince Capas LLC will agree with the layout of 32 seats and 16 tables as proposed. Number two, new drawings and the compliance checklist will be filed tomorrow with DCA upon acceptance of this agreement. Number three, we will file for a modification with DCA in early spring 2020 to modify the seat count to 48 and the table count to 24. We will also agree to operate through the entire summer of 2020 in order to allow all parties to review the operation during the summer. The modification application approval and consent will await the operation of the cafe for the summer of 2020. We are also providing the owner's name and cell phone. I won't read it out loud, it's private. And we're also providing my number and cell phone. Again, I won't read it out loud, it's in the letter. Thank you for your time and consideration for a small New York City business. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Calling up the next panel, uh, Richard uh, Ludgett and Alfonso Rund Rundano. Mato. You can just state your name and you can begin. Just Press the button to turn on the microphone. Just hold it down? Yep. Okay. My name is Richard Blodgett. Uh, my name is Richard Blodgett. I'm president of the Charlton Street Block Association, which is directly across uh, 6th Avenue from the location of the restaurant. We represent 325 households on Charlton between 6th and Varick. Um, uh, I'm surprised and thrilled that the, if I get this correctly, that the owner has, the applicant has agreed to 32 seats through the summer of next year, is that correct? I believe that's what he said in his testimony. Yeah, so uh, we favor that. We're, we're very concerned that more seats would be a terrific disruption and impede um, uh, pedestrian traffic, but if he's agreed to that through the summer of next year, we support that, and thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you, thank you for taking the time to come down here. Thank you. Thank you. you can just state your name, you, you can begin. My name is Alfonso Renato. Um, I have lived uh, in Soho since 2001, first on Thompson Street, then on McDougal Street, uh, less than one block from the location of the applicant's proposed establishment. Um, I lived in the Cesare building uh, at 51 McDougal, for which the block is being um, honorarily named Lenny and Lucy uh, Cesare Way. So I, um, I'm in tune with the neighborhood, and I have 15 years of experience directly on the block. Um, to be clear, I am. I agree with what Richard just said. Um, I. Uh, with respect to the 32 seats, but to be clear, I am supporting the proposed 32 seat legislation only insofar as it is a lower number than previously discussed um, 
the previously discussed ambitions of the primary principal, Covey Levy. For the record, I believe that 32 chairs is far too much outdoor seating for this location, will significantly impede pedestrian, pedestrian traffic um, at a number of critical choke points, and significantly and most importantly increases the probability that a pedestrian or cyclist will be injured at this already chaotic location. Additionally, as, Mr. as the speaker pointed out, it should be noted that Mr. Levy has operated an illegal outdoor cafe at Little Prince, less than 50 yards from Lola, since inception, essentially without any recourse from the city. As I highlight, I want to also point out that I submitted a very long e email with significantly more detail than I'll be able to go into here. Again, my name is Alfonso Renato, and I would encourage, encourage the subcommittee to read the details of said email. But again, um, Lola Taverna's Outdoor Cafe is already in violation of the law, despite not yet being open for business. Um, and that is primarily due to the planners that Mr. Levy has installed around the complex wraparound corner of this site. Uh, frankly, it will be interesting to see if Mr. Levy, Mr. Levy is capable of continuing to operate above the law at Lola, Taverna, at Lola Taverna as he has done so, so far at Little Prince. Um, it's worth noting the complex nature of this site plan. Um, it's essentially a wraparound footprint. It's three-sided, uh, and, and the site is essentially composed of McDougal Street, Prince Street, and then Sixth Avenue. And frankly, this, this intersection is the gateway to what is the Prince Street Commercial District and one of the most important thoroughfares in the city. It also includes two iron guards, one of which the applicant has removed, which will, with the sole purpose of expand, with, with the sole purpose of deceiving the DCA, as you heard the, uh, the attorney, as you heard the attorney mention, they're submitting revised plans because the plans they submitted earlier included the, uh, the, tr the tree fence, which would have significantly uh, limited the seating. The reason they took the tree fence down uh, is obviously so they can fit more, uh, more seats into that. Unfortunately, that has been a bad outcome for the neighborhood and the tree will be damaged. Um, the, it's also worth pointing out that the location includes an under sidewalk access point, a bus stop passenger waiting area on 6th Avenue, a USPS mailbox, two restaurant egresses, the original Sue and egress on 6th Avenue, and a new one that is on McDougal Street. And they also have to make room for the required minimum three foot uh, weight service aisle. And frankly, there is no possible way 32 chairs will fit given those requir requirements. I just want to spend a second on the planners. Um, current regulations require planners be no taller than 30 inches and be easy to remove from the sidewalk. The planner dimensions are 34 inches tall and 31 inches wide, and the fact that they are not on casters for easy movement makes them, in my opinion, Im immovable. So, in, a, in essence, every single planner that is currently there is currently in violation of the law, despite the fact that the restaurant has not actually opened. Additionally, I, 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 would, I would suggest to, to Mr. Wagoda that, these, that the new architectural plans to be submitted to DCA include these planners because the current plans that were submitted to DCA do not as far as I'm aware. Um, do I think the Prickabus team should be forced to remove these illegal planners? Of course I do not. They are gorgeous and we should all be thankful for their beautification of the space. As Speaker Johnson said, there's a positive outcome here where, uh, where a, a Greek taverna can provide value to the city. Unfortunately, I don't think um, that that's Mr. Levy's intentions. I believe his intentions are to maximize revenue. As a small business owner, I, I can relate to that. Um, that said, do I think that the Prinkapas plans should include these oversized planners and the number of cha chairs granted to the applicant be directly reduced due to their size? Of course I do. 
Um, I also think that the applicant needs to adhere to the legal uh, requirements for distances to be maintained from the planners to immovable objects, such as the Iron Tree Guard, which he had removed, obviously. There's another Iron Tree Guard on McDougal Street, and then the, uh, the, the real problem is obviously on 6th Avenue. The planner on 6th Avenue is going to cause a significant pedestrian choke point with respect to, to the, uh, with respect to the bus stop. Um, three last considerations, and then I will let the, uh, let people move on. Thanks to the speaker, with the renovated Father Fagan Park, the continued overdevelopment of West Soho Hudson Square with high-rise residential and commercial structures, the coming renovation and increased retail presence of 202 6th Avenue slash 200 Prince, and the future massive Disney and Google off office complexes that our neighborhood is going to be seeing to the west, and by the way, those two corporate entities will not be the last. We, we will continue to see West Soho become overdeveloped, and that will obviously bring a massive influx of people directly into Soho via the, gate, via the intersection of the, of the application. Additionally, as the city continues to fail to limit vehicular traffic, Soho has become an unsafe and unlivable environment during times of peak Holland Tunnel usage. McDougal Street, Thompson Street, Sullivan Street, Prince Street, Charleston Street, and nearly every street in Soho have become Holland tun Tunnel feeder streets. This is especially true at the location of the proposed application. A proposed application. Vehicles speed along both Prince and McDougal without any enforcement from NYPD. McDougal drivers pull out inappropriately onto a backed up Prince Street, often blocking 100% of the crosswalk that, um, across McDougal Street. This, this convergence of multiple street users is already unsafe in its current format. Further limiting pedestrian space with this outdoor seating will only exacerbate this, situ this situation and further endanger the lives of various street users, except for those in vehicles, obviously, who only inflict damage and do not sustain it. Additionally, the city bike station and renovated Father Fagan Park have have brought increased pedestrian traffic to the, to the immediate area, while the Prince Street bike lane is the most important westbound bicycle thoroughfare in Lower Manhattan. Without seeing uh, Mr. Rogota's revised plans, I am confident that they will force more pedestrians and more cyclists out onto 6th Avenue, Prince Street, and the bicycle lane at these busy times. Pedestrians and cyclists must already compete with vehicular overcrowding as cars approach the Holland Tunnel, often driving unsafely to beat the light, while cyclists also have to navigate these already unsafe conditions. It is my opinion that Mr. Levy and the other principals of Lola, Lola Taverna have no interest in what's best for the community. They have no intention of acting in good faith, as demonstrated by the fact pattern at Little Prince, and they have changed plans repeatedly and have indicated that they will do so again today and appear to be, frankly, in my opinion, successfully manipulating the disjointed manner in which the city handles the complex process of issuing liquor licenses, determining outdoor cafe capacity, the community board public hearing process. In my opinion, Prinkapas are only concerned about the $2,500 a month of revenue that each additional outside share outside chair contributes to its top line, as stated repeatedly publicly by Mr. Levy. I believe these fact patterns and the timeline outlined above reflect the, this potential manipulation and even potential deceptions. And, and while I obviously cannot speak to Mr. Levy's intentions, I would argue it's nearly impossible to conclude otherwise. That concludes my testimony. And again, I would point the entire city council hearing to my email, which contains significantly more detail detail than I was able to get into today. Thank you for your time. Th thank you for your testimony. Uh, I just want to remind speakers that we're keeping it to a two-minute uh, time limit.
That was just uh, two minutes, right? That was two minutes. Under, yeah, that was a little under was two minutes. Was that 20 or two? <laughs> two. Uh, we were also uh, joined by council members Levin, Richards, Rivera, Reynoso, and Rosenthal. Uh, thank you very much for your testimony today. I'd like to call up the next panelist, uh, Bob Grimelli. If you could just uh, please push the button and turn on your microphone. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Moya, members of your subcommittee. My name is Bob Gormley. I'm the district manager of Manhattan Community Board 2. I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify today regarding the application of Prinky Pass LLC, DBA Lola Taverna, located at 210 Sixth Avenue for an unenclosed sidewalk cafe. I am testifying today in support of a city council modification to this application from 22 tables and 48 chairs to 16 tables and 32 chairs. Manhattan Community Board 2 passed a resolution at its full board meeting on July 18, 2019, which was sent to the city council the following day, laying out several reasons for supporting the modification. This testimony reiterates them. First, the applicant has repeatedly violated sidewalk cafe law at another restaurant located nearby. This applicant is also the owner of Little Prince, located at 199 Prince Street, which is one half block from Lola Taverna. Unfortunately for the owner, although only one half block away, Little Prince is in an R7 zone where sidewalk cafes are not permitted. This has not deterred the applicant from continuously and illegally operating a sidewalk cafe at that location. According to the Department of Consumer Affairs, Little Prince received violations for operating an unenclosed sidewalk cafe, an unlicensed sidewalk cafe, on August 9th, 19th, 2014, June 11th, 2015, October 23rd, 2015, and August 29th, 2019. The administrative hearing for the last violation was two days ago. According to DCA, the first three violations were upheld, and the applicant paid the fine for the violation issued in 2014 and the first violation in 2015. However, the violation issued on October 23, 2015 was sent to DCA's legal division because the applicant, quote, was unresponsive when asked for payment, end quote. Second, according to the New York City Open Data Portal, there have been 15 loud music or noise complaints made against Little Prince in 2019. For most of the complaints, it is reported that, quote, the police responded to the complaint and took action to fix the condition. As a repeat offender of the Sidewalk Cafe law, as well as a regular recipient of complaints for loud noise or music that needed to be addressed and resolved by the police, this applicant has demonstrated bad faith with the city and his neighbors, and therefore it is reasonable to modify his sidewalk cafe application by reducing the number of tables and chairs. Third, when the applicant appeared before Manhattan Community Board 2's SLA licensing committee in October 2018, he stated his intention to operate a sidewalk cafe with 16 tables and 32 chairs. He further stipulated that the sidewalk cafe would close at 10 p.m. Sunday through Thursday and at 11 p.m. Friday and Saturday if, if nights. If we could just wrap, wrap it, it up. up. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll just wrap it up by saying that we received, uh, um, oh, so I'll end this paragraph. It is reasonable for the community board to, re to rely on statements made previously by, at a community board meeting uh, by, by an applicant. Fourth, uh, we received many uh, emails regarding this application. Seven people came to the committee meeting sp to speak in opposition to it. And lastly, the New York City Administrative Code explicitly gives the City Council the authority to modify a sidewalk cafe application, stating that, quote, the petitioner shall accept the modification within 15 days we're, of such we're approval. We're going to have to really wrap it up. We have a less, long, less, long less line. Okay. When all of the above is taken into consideration, Community Board 2 believes reducing the sidewalk cafe, cafe application from 16 to 16 tables and 32 chairs is both a reasonable and a just modification and is well within the City Council's authority to require it. Thank you. Th thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, are there any other members of the public who wish to testify? Did you fill out? Yes. Uh, on the sidewalk cafe? Okay. What is your name? What is your name? Okay. 
Okay, Bruce Jacobs. If you could just uh, press the button so the microphone is on and state your Hello, name. Hello, everybody. Bruce Jacobs, Coalition of the Rockaways, supporter of medical and religious freedom, 30 years New York City transit, 9-11 first responder, U.S. Navy veteran. I'm glad to see all you union guys here. Listen, I was at the Planning Commission for this job. I don't like this outdoor campaign, uh, outdoor stuff on our streets. Everything is for the rich. They say business. This is not proper. This is why poor people, regular people, can't live in this neighborhood, because you're giving everything to a, to a landowner, to a store owner, he says, for business. My thing is, is that why is he taking over the street with no kind of fees, no kind of nothing? What kind of violations has he had in past with other restaurants? To me, just to give a variance for this guy to put out tables, the guy is arguing about how many tables. Even if you have one table outside, you're blocking the street. You're blocking from people walking. My opinion is that the city council got to watch this very closely, make sure everything is proper. The idea of keep on approving variances because people could get fancy lawyers and all kind of stuff, this ain't right. What about the regular, hard-working New York City person who lives in this state? He can't walk up the street because he's blocked by a restaurant. If you don't buy restaurant food from this place, you can't walk up that street. This is preventing people from being able to walk up the street. I understand business. He wants to make it into, like, in Europe. New York City don't work like that. People live on these blocks, and people live in the area and work in the area. We want it to keep on going strong, and we want the right thing for the public of New York. Thank you. Th thank you for your testimony. Uh, are there any other members of the public who wish to testify? Seeing none, I now close the public hearing on this application. And now we will move to our votes. Uh, today we will vote to approve with modifications LU number uh, 529, the Lola Taverna application heard today by the subcommittee. We heard testimony that the applicant has operated an illegal sidewalk cafe in a resident district where sidewalk cafes are not permitted uh, at his other nearby restaurants and it has been the subject of repeated noise complaints. We will be voting to approve this cafe with a modification to reduce the size to 16 tables and 32 chairs as a response to community concerns regarding sidewalk safety and congestion and quality of life concerns from 24 tables and 48 chairs. With this modification to 16 tables and 32 chairs, uh, Council Speaker Johnson is in support of this application uh, for a sidewalk cafe so that the applicant may establish that his new establishment with a smaller than requested cafe is a good neighbor. Uh, we will also vote to approve LU items number uh, 534 and 535 for the Left Rack City Parking Garage proposal in my district in Queens. The proposal would amend the zoning resolution to revise the findings for certain parking special permits and would also approve a special permit for the subject property under the amended text. Uh, I am in support of this application. Uh, we will also vote to approve pre-considered LU item number 540, the 9105 Beach Channel Drive rezoning proposal in Queens. The proposal would establish a C23 commercial overlay within an existing uh, R4A district to legalize an existing funeral home and its accessory parking lot. Councilmember Ulrich is in support of this application. We will also vote to approve pre-considered LU number 541 for the 1513 Clintonville Street rezoning proposal in Queens. The proposal would establish a C13 commercial overlay within an existing R31 district to legalize an existing commercial use on the property as well as its facility and its future development and modernization. Council Member Vallone is in support of this application. We will also vote to approve pre-considered LU number uh, 542 for the 112-06 71st 
Road rezoning proposal. In Queens, the proposal would rezone an existing R12A district to an R32 district and would bring into uh, conformance two separate existing non-conformance uh, conforming use group for medical offices within the rezoning area. Councilmember Kozlowitz is in support of this application. We will also vote to approve with modifications pre-considered LU numbers uh, 531, 532, and 533 for the Vernon Boulevard Broadway rezoning proposal in Queens. This application was originally proposed, sought a uh, zoning map amendment, a zoning text amendment, and a special permit for a large-scale general development, which together would facilitate the construction of three new mixed-use buildings and a total of approximately 17,700 square feet of public uh, accessible open area. The proposed zoning text amendment originally sought to establish a mandatory inclusionary housing area utilizing options one and two. Our modifications will be to remove option two and retain option one. Uh, Council Member Van Bramer is in support of this application, and we will also vote to approve with modifications pre-considered LU uh, numbers uh, 538 and 539 for the 38th Street, 35th Avenue rezoning proposal in Queens. The application as originally proposed sought a zoning map amendment and a zoning text amendment to establish a mandatory inclusionary housing area utilizing option two. Our modification will be to remove option two and to add option one. Council Member Van Bramer is in support of this application as modified. We will also vote to approve with modifications pre-considered LU items number 543 and 544 for the Terrence Cardinal Cook proposal in Manhattan. The application as originally proposed sought approval for a zoning map amendment to change the existing R72 district to an R8 district and an R72 uh, C15 to an R8 C15, as well as a zoning text amendment to map the site, a mandatory inclusionary housing area, utilizing option two to facilitate the rehabilitation of the existing Terrence Cardinal Cook Flower Hill skilled nursing facility and redevelop, uh, redevelopment to include 150 units of supportive housing, 379 residential units, and a PACE medical facility. Our modification would be to remove option two and to add option one. Council Member Ayala is in support of this application as modified. And I now call for a vote to approve LU's 529, 530. Oh, sorry, uh, to approve LU's 534, 535, uh, 540, 541, and 542. Uh, to approve with modifications, LU uh, 529, LU's 531, 532, 533, 538, 539, 543, and 544. Council, please call the roll. Chair Moya. Uh, aye on all. Council Member Levin. Aye on all. Council Member Richards. Aye on all. Council Member Reynoso. Aye on all. Council Member Grudenchik. Aye. Council Member Rivera. Aye. Current roll is six in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions. The vote will remain open. We will now continue uh, with our public hearings. We will now uh, hear a pre-considered LU item uh, C190390ZMM for the 25 Central Park West application relating to property in Council Member Rosenthal's district in Manhattan. The applicant seeks approval for a zoning map amendment to establish a C25 commercial overlay district within an existing R10A district. As proposed, this action would bring three existing lawful non-conforming commercial units uh, at the ground floor into conformance under zoning. And now I open the public hearing to this application, but uh, I would like to uh, turn it over for Councilmember Rosenthal for some remarks. Thank you, Chair Moya. Actually, I'm, I'll have questions for the applicant after make, they make their presentation. I appreciate you. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, Richard Lobel and Frank uh, Nor Noriega. Please raise your right hand and state your name for the record. Richard Lobel. Frank Noriega. Do you swear or affirm that, uh, that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and you will answer all questions truthfully? I do. I do. Thank you.
Thank you. Good morning, Chair Moya, Council members. We're here today to discuss the 25 Central Park West rezoning. So you can see from the land use map, the zoning map in front of you, the circled area is the area where the rezoning was uh, is proposed, and that is on Central Park West between 62nd and 63rd Street. So there's a few things to note about the existing zoning map. The first is that uh, this building, the Century Apartments, a landmark designated building from 1985, originally built in the 1930s, uh, actually has 250 feet of depth in its lot, and 200 feet are located within this existing R10A. 50 feet are actually already located in a C47 zoning district, which permits rather intensive commercial units. Some other things to note about this property are that to the block to the south of the property, there's a current C66 uh, zoning district also allowing for intensive commercial uses. Uh, at to two blocks to the south, as well as the C47 immediately to the west and the south of the property. So this is the proposed rezoning as set forth on a tax map, and the rezoning would rezone this frontage, which is R10A, with a, uh, with a commercial overlay, C25. What this would allow would basically be for the continued commercial use and conformance of three commercial stores which are currently located on this frontage. So as you can see, the, uh, the frontage would, would it be 100 feet back from the uh, Central Park West facade, which would capture the uh, commercial stores which are longstanding, dating back to the origins of the building. This is a land use map just to generally show, show some of the commercial uses in the area. As you can see, obviously, this is a very commercially intense area. You have Columbus Circle two blocks to the south. This is discussed as an extension of the 8th Avenue corridor. So there are uh, a large number of commercial uses immediately around this area. And so on the, this is what the rezoning would look like on the land use map. It would rezone this frontage with a depth of 100 feet for the C25 zoning district. So um, to note, uh, this is a, a seller plan and then this is a more detailed first floor plan. The rezoning is primarily requested in order to allow for a PCE or physical cultural establishment on the southeastern corner of the lot. So this is currently a drugstore which uh, as a matter of public record is failing. And so um, currently right now you would be able to populate this space with a use group six commercial use. However, as the council is aware from previous testimony, a PCE or gym is not permitted uh, as a use group six use. It's actually only permitted in C2 districts. Most commercial rezonings now, particularly ones that are sponsored by the city, actually already include C2 rezonings. Most recently, the uh, East Harlem rezoning not only maintains C2 commercial overlays for most of its overlays, but also now has done away with the PCE special permit. So one of the, I think, difficulties as far as populating these spaces particularly with gyms, is that right now a PCE gym operator needs to go through a rather lengthy, costly process at the Board of Standards and Appeals. So in the East Harlem rezoning, they've done away with that. As a matter of, as of right, you can go in and locate. However, until that uh, text is changed citywide, owners are still required to go in and to get special approval for PCEs. Um, this is just some additional plan materials and layouts as far as the building is concerned, and then we have some pictures. You'll note uh, pictures of the development site. Again, this is a, a building that, which was originally uh, a Channon building uh, dating back to the 1930s. There's a, it was individually designated as a landmark in 1985, so this building has great historical importance, uh, which means several things despite the fact that it is a beautiful building and contributing to the area. Any changes to the facade are, uh, go through a strenuous um, a review of landmarks and are, are not an as-of-right process, thereby uh, leading to difficulties as far as any changes to any storefronts. It, it really is onerous on, on unit owners here. And so um, the idea here would be to allow for a PCE use in this uh, you know, formerly tenanted space and to allow for a productive use of the property. As I just paged through the final uh, pictures, I would say that um, the building, as a matter of public record, does not have a gym. Uh, so uh, it's something that would be available to building residents, and I know obviously it's considered to be a, an amenity to have a PCE, a gym, a yoga studio available to residents of the building, particularly where they have no opportunity for that now. So that's essentially the rezoning, and I'm happy to answer any questions. I just yeah, have thank two, you. Just okay. two quick questions, and then I'll turn it over to Councilmember Rosenthal. Uh, just if you can... Say again, why, why weren't you able to have um, 
another legal non-conforming uh, use instead of uh, the example of the yoga studio? So um, I guess the best thing to do is to look at the site map. So in the store on the southeast corner of the lot, uh, there is currently an existing grandfathered commercial use. And so in the three commercial use, units that are indicated on the map on both this, the uh, northeast and southeast corners, there is existing legal commercial uses that are available as of right. Those can be populated by stores, retail operations and such. You can't populate that with a gym. And so there's been a, a, a lengthy process where the owner, again, as a matter of public record, has gone out to the drugstore owner, has made attempts to allow him to stay here, but it's basically a failing business. And I think it kind of reflects some of the literature that's come out, particularly from city planning, as far as the challenges in this, re in this area with retail to begin with. So while you could do a use group six use, uh, you can't do a PCE use, and that's really the, the, uh, the cornerstone of the application. And so have you considered pursuing other uses other than the yoga studio that would be allowed under the proposed uh, commercial overlay? Yes, and, and as a matter of fact, we've discussed those throughout the public hearing process. Um, and I think that uh, particularly the Manhattan Borough President, Gail Brewer, was interested in this and we had a very lengthy conversation at her hearing for close to an hour uh, the owner very well established the fact that they've gone out. There was a, a medical laboratory which was perfect for the space. Um, eventually the medical laboratory found that the vibration from the nearby subway was too great to conduct um, their testing and so they had to, they could no longer stay. There's, um, there, were other, um, there were other retail operations which came in, signed a letter of intent, and then for whatever reason were no longer able to operate there. It's been a very lengthy process for the applicant, one which they, you know, frankly would have chosen not to pursue in, unless they were pushed to this application. Um, but having said that, this is where they find themselves and, and they just want the opportunity to be able to, to go out to a, a greater range of commercial uses, particularly a yoga studio. The yoga studio, by the way, this is, not just, um, uh, this is not just something which is created by the applicant. They had a letter of intent with Yoga Works. Um, yoga Works was going to come in, but then because they weren't able to locate here, um, through just through a DOB application, they uh, eventually decided to take another space which was available, leaving them with um, no potential tenant. Thank you. Sure. And now I want to turn it over to Councilmember Rosenthal for questions. Thank you so much, Chair Moya. Um, I just, I'm going to ask a few questions just to clarify what we think we know. Sure. Um, thank you. Um, is there common ownership among the three retail condos, how many owners are there? So um, between the three retail con uh, owners, um, there are separate LLCs, but the interest holders are the same. Between units C1, which is on the southeastern portion of the property, and C2 and C3 on the northeastern portion of the property. So I'm, I'm gonna ask you to say that oh, one please. more time. So in other words, C1, separate from C2 and 3 Correct. are subsets of something larger. Correct. And just to note, because it might be easy on the color-coded map, C1 would be the space in the lower right-hand corner. Yep. C2 and 3 would be the space on the upper, upper right-hand corners that's populated by the salon on the Central Park West Frontage and the laundry, the uh, dry cleaners further back. Okay. Do I need to ask you why that is or should I let it go? When you say why that is, mm -hmm. can you ask me? Why they chose to organize that way to have sub-ownership oh. and... and we're happy to answer supplementally. I think it's probably just a matter of corporate authority. Okay, and what's the, under the proposed rezone, over, commercial overlay, what's the likelihood that one of the retail units would be combined or converted into a restaurant or bar? Uh, I'd say it's, it's slim to none. Uh, the reason I'm comfortable saying it on the record is for several reasons. The first is that to the extent that store two and store three on the northeast co corner could combine, they, they're able to do that right now. Um, they have commercial uses in the space, they'd be able to combine. These are long-standing commercial tenants which have a long history in the area. Um, a lot of people come here from the building, do their dry cleaning here and use the salon. So for, to the extent there's successful tenancies, there's no reason for that. And then that just leaves the property on the, on the lower right-hand corner. And with regard specifically to 
Uh, I know that uh, the council members expressed concern over restaurant and cafe use. The lower right-hand um, lot, or the lower right-hand portion, is currently the subject of a restrictive declaration. So in the 12th Amendment to the Condo Declaration, as a matter of agreement, they're unable to do uses that, quote, involve cooking or installation of a commercial kitchen, uh, and so they couldn't have a restaurant there. And so fundamentally, the question would be, and this is, I'm piecing this together Please. also from the community board's recommendation to r disapprove unless, um, since the condo declaration only applies to the bottom right-hand corner, would it be possible for that declaration to expand to include the entire commercial overlay. My guess is that would be a long process. Yes. And then secondarily, would they agree to signing a commitment letter, which I know holds less weight in law, but might be a possibility to get the owners of the three doctor's offices along Central Park to sign on as well. So I, th I think it would be difficult to have the owners of the doctor's offices do that. I'd say just a couple of things about those units because um, you know, I understand the concerns expressed about what could go on there. Um, you know, the first thing I'd note is that, and, and I think it's clear from taking a look at the frontage of this building, the frontage in the facade is specifically cited in the landmarks report as being integral to the character of the building. And so obviously, and not only would any changes need to go through landmarks, but any changes to that facade would need to go through the condo board, more importantly. And so to the extent that the building thought it was a great thing to do that, they would potentially find that support. But to the extent, as we kind of know, that this would be something which would be a concern, they would not cite that approval. And you're looking at the facade that would exist both before and after any application. The other thing that we'd note is that these spaces themselves are, they're not great for that proposed use. They're great for doctor's offices in, on this frontage, but the unit 1N and unit 1L in particular to the northern portion, uh, they number about, eight, about 600 and 1,000 feet, so 1,600 feet total. Those units also don't have access from the outdoor area. They basically, uh, patients and, and clients go in through the building lobby and they, have, they also have no cellar space. So unlike most commercial operations where you'd be able to store and have back office operations in a cellar, here they're basically looking at a very limited square footage in order to do that. So I think all of these things together combine to make it highly infeasible for any type of commercial, uh, you know, commercial establishment in that area. And, and then the last thing I'd note is that there's two units at the rear of this building which have been zoned C47 since 1961, and neither of those, those, got, those have been doctor's offices for 60 years. So it's a fairly fixed floor plate. Um, you can imagine there's some challenges to making changes to that. So I think all those things kind of combine to make it infeasible that anything else is gonna happen there. One of the issues that Borough President Brewer raised was um, having some sort of liveliness in the windows um, at the location in the south um, east, according to the way we're looking at it, corner. Um, is there an agreement that that could happen, that it won't be just blocked off as the way most yoga studios are? So what are we able to say? So we don't have a tenant because we don't yet have any zoning uh, affecting this. And my owners are, uh, more than anything else, uh, as a, also as a matter of record, they own 19 residential units in this building. They're the, la they're the largest owner of residential units in this building. So what's good for the building is good for them. So the, the best I can tell you, council member, is that um, I've shared the borough president's recommendations with them. They've expressed a willingness to work with the community in order to um, basically share these concerns, to share these concerns with potential tenants, and to really try to activate the space and make it a very lively space. They have every interest in this um, beautifying the area, being an open area, being a safe corner, not going dark. So um, we're, we're happy that these recommendations were made and we would really look forward to engaging a tenant and basically working with them to try to do our best in that regard. Would they be willing to sign a commitment letter to that effect? Um, 
I'd kind of have to discuss this with them separately. Okay. I mean, I know that obviously we enter into different commitments to the to the city council. I have it on their good word right now, but I'd have to talk to them specifically. Great, I'd appreciate that feedback before the vote. And then um, just a question of understanding. Um, at the city planning commission, I think there was a labor representative who raised some concerns um, about a broader practice of bringing non-conforming oh. uses into conformance. Sure. Can you can you ex can you give me your response to that question? Sure. I so the, the gentleman who spoke at that uh, at the hearing is here today. It's Bruce Jacobs. He's a, a Navy veteran, a former 9-11 first responder, uh, and, and exercises his civil rights to speak on, on many of these applications. Uh, we've engaged and discussed his concerns separately. Um, so, um, you know, I, I think uh, we'd love to hear this testimony in, 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 in that regard. But um, I, I think, and of course, he's able to speak for himself. Uh, but I think with regards to the specific points that were raised, um, he was he he didn't have a, necessarily have an understanding of the fact that these were grandfathered uses, which were able to exist at the site on a going forward basis without any approval from the city. So it's basically the expansion, the only expansion into the gym use that we'd be seeking. Thank you. Sure. Um, what the applicant would that person consider renting to a community facility like a doctor's office or something like that? Have they considered that? Um, I think that they have. I mean, this is this is a, an, an owner who's been, and again, we have a range of applications before the city council, but they've been engaged in the entire process. We've, you know, really talked about this extensively. Um, I think that they wanted to go through this application process with the least amount of trouble possible. To the to the extent they didn't have to go through rezoning, they would not do that. Um, my understanding from them is that is that when when they had certain PCE users who came in, and this was discussed at the community board. Some of them said, you know what, we're going to locate here. You don't have to worry about it. We'll have our lease, and we'll come in illegally and then subsequently legalize that use. And I see your surprise, but truthfully, kind of as, as a matter of course at BSA, close to half of the gym PC applicants do that. They, they come in, and then they seek to legalize after in an effort to get operating capital and, and essentially bring people to their side. Um, the owners refused that. They basically said, we, don't, we want to do this the right way, and so that's the reason they engage in this process. They've been unable to find uh, a, a tenant for this space with the very attractive use group six commercial uses uh, straight on down. So the answer to the question is, I think that they're open to, to, to a range of applicants uh, and tenants, but they just haven't been able to find it. Okay, thank you very much. And just in conclusion, you see that what I'm weighing is from the community board, a concern about something that might be disruptive to the local community. And of course, weighing the interests of the owners of the space trying to rent out what will potentially be an empty storefront, which no one wants to see that right. either. Um, so thank you for answering my questions. Um, I appreciate your time. Thank, thank you, you Chair. council member. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony today. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I want to call up the next panelist, uh, Bruce Jacobs. Uh, just a reminder that we're keeping it to two minutes. Hello, everybody, again. Bruce Jacobs, Coalition of the Rockaways, supporter of medical and religious freedom, fighter for Rockaways and all of Queens and really all of New York City. On, on this issue here, there is a couple of problems. Where is the, those tenants to say are in non-compliance? You know, they say that this three guys, some guys are non-compliance. I don't see them in this courtroom, I mean in this city hall meeting. You go and by the word of somebody with a lawyer. This lawyer is a very nice lawyer, a very nice person, but where is the, the defense for these people? Another thing is, why now? I mean, you know, they say for a gym, that's a good excuse. Is there any proof that it's going to be a gym? Is there any proof that it's going to stay a yoga, you know, a yoga treating? Or can they do whatever they want once you guys approve it? To me, that is a, 
an important issue because you guys might mean well, and I appreciate you guys even here. There's not really enough, but I appreciate it. The thought that there's no actual commitment what could be done here. Now, another problem with this is on these fixing up of these stores and everything, I really like to see that they use union people for this work because we want apprenticeship program so people get ahead. I was lucky. I worked for the New York City Transit. I got a pension. They take care of me, medical, everything. I don't want just temporary jobs for people. I want permanent. Even if this is just fixing up a store, he says something about some kind of house, and the idea is I like to know who's going to be doing this work, and you know it's important to me. But I would like, like the commissioner over here said, get a commitment letter that they're going to keep it as a certain store. And I would like to see the people be, come to this to defend themselves. Thank you very much. Enjoy your day. Thank you for your testimony. Um, are there any other members of the public who wish to testify? Seeing none, I now close the public hearing on this application. Uh, we will now hear Pre-considered LU items uh, C190124 ZMQ and N190125 ZRQ for the 44-01 Northern Boulevard rezoning proposal related, relating to property in Council Member Van Bramer's district in Queens. The applicant seeks approval of a zoning map amendment to rezone an existing M11 district to an R7X and an R6B district with a C24 commercial overlay and a zoning text amendment to establish a mandatory inclusionary housing area utilizing options one and two. Together, these actions would facilitate the construction of a new four and 10 story building with approximately 335 dwelling units, ground floor retail, and 156 off street parking spaces. I now open the public hearing on this application and like to call up uh, Richard Bass. Good morning, Thanks. Chair. Thank you for uh, having me this morning. Just before we begin, I just want the council to swear you in. Please state your name for the record and raise your right hand. Richard Bass. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that you will answer all questions truthfully? I do. Thank you, Arthur. Thank you. This is why I have kids. <laughs> Thanks. Good morning. This application is for uh, two actions. One is a map change and a text change. Uh, the applicant is 4401 Northern Boulevard uh, LLC, uh, also known as Major Auto World. He currently occupies the space. He's been there for several decades. His intention is to reoccupy the space after it's redeveloped. The architect is Rowling's Architect. Uh, Hannock is our affordable housing provider. Uh, I'm with Ackerman LL LLP. Uh, not on the screen, we also have an agreement with 32BJ. We've had it for about nine, 10 months. They're going to be our union reps on the, on the site. Um, I'll go through this quickly. Here's the zoning map. Uh, the north side of Northern Boulevard where the site is located is primarily residential. The south side is commercial. Uh, these are pictures of the, the site. Uh, currently, there's approximately 17 to 19 curb cuts on the site. The proposed building will have approximately 335 residential units. Approximately 100 units will be affordable. Uh, 36,000 square feet of retail, which would be the applicant coming back on the site as a auto retail sales. Uh, the building will be eight stories tall on Northern Boulevard, will set back, will change materials for the upper two stories to allow it to be lighter and airier. Uh, the side streets will have townhouse design where the ground floor will have entrances, so there will be life on the street, but the upper uh, second, third, and fourth floors will be apartment style with uh, corridors. As I mentioned before, the two actions are a zoning map amendment uh, changing uh, the three lots from M11 
to a R7X and a C6B with a, a, a commercial overlay, a C24. And the zoning text amendment would designate the area as an MIH. Uh, we made this application using option two uh, at the suggestion of the council member when we met with him uh, prior to certification. The community board voted in favor of this application, 23 to eight, uh, to support the rezoning, and they suggested option one. Uh, the applicant is open to option one. The borough president also supported the application. Here's the before and after uh, zoning maps. Shows the, the R7X with the commercial overlay that will allow the, uh, the current occupant and applicant to come back on the site. This is what the MIH uh, option one or two, depending on what the council approves, will look like. Uh, as I mentioned, the, uh, the proposed development will uh, have massing on uh, Northern Boulevard. Northern Boulevard is one of the widest streets in Queens. It was zone M11 in 1961. Um, this is an appropriate rezoning for residential use. This shows the site plan. Uh, there will be an internal open space that will be open to all uh, occupants of the building. Here's what the ground floor would look like with the cars, uh, with the, the, you know, the applicant coming back on the site. The elevation showing the, uh, uh, the height of the building on northern, stepping down to the townhouse design on the side streets. Looking straight on on Northern Boulevard. Um, in accordance with uh, HPD's AMI rates here uh, are the average and medium income. The community board asked us to examine both the option one and option two, uh, which uh, is here on the, on the screen. They also asked us to look at a unit distribution, which we also provided. Uh, the community board did not uh, specify the unit count or the breakdown. They only specified option one. The community board also asked for a listing of how we're going to be sustainable. Uh, just for the record, we met with the community board four times before certification, so we had a very long and uh, in-depth conversation with them. Uh, as I mentioned before, Hannock will be our affordable housing provider. They're known in the area. And that is my presentation. Great, thank you. Just a couple of questions. Yes, just sir. Just sticking with the community board, uh, with their vote to approve with the condition that the applicant uses MIH option one. So am I hearing you correctly? Is that uh, what the applicant is willing to meet that condition? For? Absolutely. Okay. All right. Uh, you also are proposing the R7X zoning district, which allows 14, 14 story uh, building. But your proposal, your proposed building is only 10 stories in height. Could you explain why you are not utilizing the additional height? Um, one uh, additional height would make the building inefficient. Uh, you know, we design buildings so they're, they're efficient and uh, they make economic sense. Uh, this is not you know, midtown Manhattan where you, know, you can get very tall buildings and get extra uh, sales or rents for height. Uh, a 10-story building is appropriate. And so are, are you using all of the available FAR for your 10 story? Y yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That's, that's all the questions I have. Thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you so much. I'd like to call up uh, the next panelist, uh, Federico Hernandez. Hello, okay. Good morning, Chairman Moya, a member of the sub-community. Uh, my name is Federico Hernandez. Um, I'm a porter, and I've been a member of the 32BJ for six years. I'm here today on behalf of my union to express our support to the, proce the process on development of 4401 of the Boulevard. 
Uh, 32 BJ represent over 400, no, 4,400 members. And I'm sorry, I just got a little nervous. Uh, let me just read, read. Um, the 32 BJ represent over 4,400 members who live and work on the community district one. At 32 BJ, we support development that create good jobs and property service, job of family and substantial wages and help bring the working family to the, into the middle class. We are pleased to report that Bruce Bandel, the developer of this project, has made a credible commitment to pay prevailing wages to the future building services and workers on this side. The prevailing wages is a uh, life wages that includes significant benefits like payday off, sick time, retirement, and health benefits. Jobs like mine are, li are the life-changing, giving working class family access to upward mobility and security. In addition, this project will bring 100 units much needed permanently affordable housing to the neighborhood. And we see uh, this responsible development and urge you to approve this project. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony today. Bruce Jacobs. Good, 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 good morning, everybody. Once again, Bruce Jacobs, Coalition of Rockaways, supporter of medical and religious freedom, fighter for the Rockaways, all of Queens, and really all of New York City. You know, I'm happy to see union here. Let me explain to you one thing, CB, you know, your, for your union. They always promise the world and then they hire one guy. I have affordable housing across the street from me. Before you say yes, yes, yes to a project, make sure that they are keeping their words because you could hire one guy is when you need 10, 20 guys. Remember that. Another thing about this project, that I didn't like was that at the CB 120 Broadway, I heard something different, that it wasn't a guy that was in develop, that wasn't doing bad. Now they say that he wants to stay on the side. I like to see this automobile person, you know, owner in this place, because I like to know if that's really the truth. Another thing, affordable housing, are they gonna really use union labor or are they just gonna hire people? The Coalition of Rockways wants to make sure that they have union apprentice jobs for everybody. Not just prevailing wage, we need benefits. The most important thing in life is that you have a history of work, real work. Anybody could come with a fancy lawyer and say, I want stores and I want this and I want that. We want the regular worker, the regular person who most people came from, because I'm not the best speaker, I'm not a politician. Um, we really want to see this built right. He says 100 affordable at M2, it's really not affordable, but we need affordable for everybody, for all workers, for all regular people, not just multimillionaires. If I say I want to knock down my house, they'll tell me, oh, you can't do it. Some guy comes in with a fancy lawyer, it's okay. Thank you very much for your Thank help. You. Have a nice day. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public who wish to testify? Uh, seeing none, I now close the public hearing on this application. Uh, we will move now to hear uh, LU items number 550 through 554 for the Peninsula Hospital Redevelopment Plan relating to property in Council Member Richards District in Queens. The applicant seeks approval for an amendment of the city map, a zoning map amendment to rezone an existing R5 district to a C44 district, establish a C12 commercial overlay within an existing uh, R5 district and to rezone an existing C81 district to a C43A district. The proposal 
The proposal would also include a large-scale general development special permit to modify the underlying bulk and sign regulations and a zoning text amendment to establish a mandatory inclusionary housing area and to modify the allowable use to allow a physical cultural establishment uh, as of right within the large-scale project area. I now open the public hearing on this application. Uh, I want to turn it over to Councilmember Richards for some remarks. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you. And especially want to thank community members who've come out today. Uh, um, I'm going to be very short because I want them to get through the presentation, but I want to thank the Arkers uh, for certainly taking an interest in the Rockaways. And as I always say, you know, we um, certainly are an underserved community. This area has certainly had its challenges of any development happening in it over the course of the last uh, four decades at least. And, you know, one of the things that's going to be important through these conversations and negotiations are the community benefits and what that looks like for our community. You know, we're used to seeing a lot of housing, um, but the amenities that must come along um, with housing have to be a part of this plan for us to get to a yes. So I want to thank the ARCAs for certainly listening. Uh, and now I'm looking forward to turning listening into application. So. Um, Let's get to work. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, I want to call up uh, Jacqueline Skarinci. Is that, did I say it correctly? Yes. Uh, Daniel Moritz and Ariel Afang. Yes, sir, you can please swear in the panel. Please raise your right hand and state your name for the record. Jacqueline Skarinci. Daniel Moritz. Ariel Afgang. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that you will answer all questions truthfully? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Moya, Councilman Richards, and members of the City Council. I'm Jacqueline Skernchi of Ackerman LLP. Also presenting today are Daniel Moritz, Principal of the Arker Companies, and Ariel Afgang, Principal of Afgang Architects. Team members also available for our questions today are Alex Arker and Simon Backus of the Arker Companies, uh, COVID Saxena and Kendra Armstead of Sam Schwartz Engineering, the project's environmental consultant, and Chuck Harper from Lingen Engineering, the project's civil engineer. Thank you for the opportunity to present the Peninsula Redevelopment to you today, which we believe will be a groundbreaking and transformative project that is needed to revitalize Edgemere and create a vibrant new place to live, work, and play. The large-scale plan that is before you today has been shaped by both urban design planning principles and direct community feedback at both community-led visioning sessions and direct meetings with Rockaway residents that both Ari and Dan will speak to later in the presentation. As part of this community visioning process, the community voted on Edgemere Commons, the name you see here today. To orient you to the site, the site is located on the Rockaway Peninsula in the Edgemere neighborhood of, of Queens. Um, it's located adjacent to the elevated A train. So the site today, as you can see from the pictures, uh, is a dormant superblock campus that's predominantly made up of paved over impermeable surface lot that cuts off the community from all access from Beach Channel Drive down to Rockaway Beach Boulevard, from Beach 50th Street down to Beach 53rd Street. The site fronts on Beach Channel Drive, the major commercial thoroughfare through the Rockaways. However, this part of Edgemere has been identified as both a federal food and retail desert. The map on the right highlights the nearly 10 blocks between Beach 49th Street and Beach 59th Street where there has been no retail or economic development for residents. To give a brief project overview, the project will have 2,200 units uh, phased over 10 to 15 year period that will be affordable and moderate income dwelling units. Uh, we'll go into the AMIs later in the presentation will have approximately 150,000 square feet of non-residential, commercial, and community facility space, including a 20,000 square foot supermarket in the first phase of the project, uh, approximately 38,000 square feet of publicly accessible open space, and approximately 1,000 accessory parking spaces. 
To state for the record, the applicant is requesting a series of land use and zoning actions, which will include a city map change to map a small portion of Beach 52nd Street, a zoning map amendment from the R5, R5, C12, zoning districts to C44 on the northern parcel, and then from a C81 to a C43A on the southern parcel. Also asking for a zoning tax amendment to designate the project area, mandatory inclusionary housing area, and then zoning special permits uh, for the large scale plan, which include uh, modification to the height and setback requirements, as well as the signage requirements for the site. I'll now turn it over to Dan. Oh, sorry, Ar Ari, to walk through the site plan. Good morning, Chair Moya and Council Members. Our inspiration for this design is really based on the culmination of years of our team's experience in redeveloping large parcels, as well as years of designing in floodplains across the city, always focusing on the neighborhood at large by protecting and adding to the existing character in order to serve the local population first, hence building a welcoming destination for new residents and customers. We are going to be building a new town center and street grid complete with all of the amenities this neighborhood deserves and needs. The pedestrian focal point at the center is High Point Plaza at the intersection of the extended Beach 52nd Street and Peninsula Way. High Point Plaza is envisioned as an active new green boulevard with wide sidewalks, rain gardens, seating areas, restaurants, and local retail leading to the new pathway to the beach. The retail at the center of the project will be elevated out of the floodplain, which is the safest way to be resilient in a flood. A large drive-up supermarket is a key component of this plan with a large self-service parking lot. Here on this slide, you see the feel of the sidewalk and open spaces in our proposed project. Social interaction will be encouraged through thoughtfully designed spaces. Lighting is paramount as well. We designed a suite of custom outdoor fixtures to give character to this place and to amply light all public areas for a safe and secure feel. Creative storefront treatments will make our retail spaces desirable in order to attract local purveyors. And green, green, green. Trees and gardens will be everywhere, softening the hardscapes and absorbing the water. We've already started planning one of the larger retail spaces as a food hall, which can be a hub for local culinary entrepreneurs. All of the open space will be complete with passive and active recreation areas, including a play area for kids that you could see here. Resiliency <clears throat> planning is also at the core of this project. No rainwater that falls on the property will leave the parcel. A series of dry wells and bioswales will control all of the runoff. We have with us Chuck Harper from Langen, who can answer questions about resiliency as well. Now we can discuss community benefits with Dan. Good morning, and thank you, Chair Moya and Council Member Richards, for having us here today to present our vision for Edgemere Commons, a groundbreaking development in Edgemere one that will help to both revitalize and transform the area into a vibrant live, work, play neighborhood. I'm Dan Moritz, one of the principals of the Arker Companies. I'm here with my partners, Alex Arker and Simon Backus, as well as our amazing team. We are a fully integrated third generation family real estate company who's been building in New York for over 50 years. We've developed over 8,000 units of housing and approximately a million square feet of commercial and community facility space throughout New York, including many developments in Queens, from Jamaica to Richmond Hill to the Rockaways. Our family commitment is to build and preserve high quality and thoughtfully designed mixed income and mixed use communities. And most recently, we celebrated the opening of our Beach Channel senior residences in the Rockaways, along with Council Member Richards, to welcome over 200 new seniors into a brand new, beautiful, and sustainable affordable housing building. It's hard to summarize the last three years of work that has gone into the creation of the plan for Edgemere Commons, <clears throat> but at the core of it has been community engagement. 
It's been an amazing experience spending time with valued members of the Rockaways. The slide shows a number of community organizations and local entrepreneurs that we've been meeting with, in addition to hosting large and small events over the past few years. That outreach resulted in a huge turnout in the community board meeting, where the actual community voted for us, with over 75% of the speakers passionately supportive of the project. Out of our planning sessions, we came to focus on five key community benefits, including mixed income affordable housing, local hiring, retail and community facilities, recreation and open space, and resiliency and storm preparedness. The goal of Edgebeer Commons is to create an exciting live, work, play environment, which required creative integration of non-residential uses and housing throughout the site. The need for a full service supermarket was the number one community request that came out of our early planning sessions. And the site plan was redesigned in order to ensure we could accommodate a successful supermarket. For the balance of the retail and community space, we will be looking to curate a unique blend of regional retail and homegrown entrepreneurs, as well as a range of community users, including medical, cultural, educational, and office space for local nonprofits. Additionally, we've been working with Council Member Richards on the inclusion of a community center within the development and expect to finalize the design and location as part of the final plan. Our family focuses on the development of mixed income and mixed use developments. We've heard across the board of the brain drain from the Rockaways, of millennials that may have grown up in the Rockaways who want to return but have trouble finding an affordable apartment to rent. This next generation of Rockaway leaders and entrepreneurs need affordable places to return to and most certainly will qualify to live at Edgemere Commons. And these young leaders of the Rockaways showed remarkable passion in supporting the project at the community board hearing and throughout the public process. We work within the framework of the city's affordable housing programs designed to serve a wide range of incomes, in this case between 30 and 130 percent of area median income. The project will be MIH option one and the balance of units are expected to line up with the HPD programs shown on the table here by building. Last but not least is the economic impact that Edgemere Commons will have. We estimate that we will average three to 350 construction jobs annually and add approximately six to 650 permanent jobs to the development once completed. And we're proud to announce that we've made an agreement with 32BJ for the residential building maintenance at the project. At the Arker Companies, we pride ourselves on local hiring and have dem demonstrated success doing so in the Rockaways and throughout the city. We expect to work with the elected officials, community board, and local community-based organizations to ensure that new hiring opportunities go to members of the community. It's been an amazing learning experience spending the past three years working with the community to develop this plan. But more importantly, meeting amazing individuals and organizations along the way. I'm excited this is only the beginning and that once we open the doors to these buildings, we all have helped contribute to the revitalization of Edgemere. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Just a couple of questions before I uh, hand it over to Council Member Richards. Just so I got it straight, you are committed to providing a grocery store on site? Yes. Okay. We, we designed the first phase of the building specifically to accommodate uh, a grocery store. Okay, great. Uh, and since this project is within the flood plan, uh, what are the resiliency measures that uh, you will be responsible for uh, when it comes to the deploying of the flood barriers? Sure. I'd ask Chuck to come up from Langen, who's our civil engineer. Um, he's um, responsible for the design of the resiliency measures here. Can you go to the resiliency slide? in the, at the end, no. It's in the appendix. Please uh, raise your right hand, state your name for the record. Uh, Chuck Harper with Langen. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and you answer all questions truthfully? I do. Thank you. Thank you. So Chuck, just so, just I want to make sure, uh, what are the resiliency measures 
that you're including on this site, and then also uh, who will be responsible for deploying the flood barriers? I may defer the second question to ownership. Uh, but from a design perspective, we have three uh, strategies. So the best strategy in the flood zone is to elevate the site. We are beholden to the street grid, uh, the existing grades around the perimeter of the site, which ranges from elevation five to six and a half. Uh, the design flood elevation in this condition is 11. The base flood is 10. Uh, these elevations are all in NABD 88. Uh, so the area in white is elevated above the flood zone, uh, and that is we raised as fast as we could while still adhering to ADA guidelines. It's the last page in the exhibits. Uh, with that, the sites that show up in green uh, are, are the buildings that show up in green are raised to that elevation 11 as well, uh, the center of the site getting as high as 14. Uh, the areas in, I guess what you would call beige or orange, are dry flood proofed, so those areas would have the deployable barriers uh, to keep the water out for hydrostatic and hydrodynamic pressure. And then the areas in sort of the purple color are wet flood proofed, which means that you allow the flood water to come in uh, so the building isn't damaged by a differential in pressure from one side to the other. Uh, but that's limited to parking, storage, and just building entries. Um, as for deployment of the barriers, I assume. Yeah, so as ownership, um, us and our management company would be responsible. Um, we have um, already constructed two new buildings within um, uh, the flood zone post Sandy. One, our senior housing property in the Rockaways, um, and the other on Bay Street in Staten Island, uh, both of which have the deployable floodgates, and our building maintenance staff is trained and understands how to install them in the case um, where it's necessary. Uh, will the buildings have power if the electrical grid goes down after a flood? So we're gonna have on-site generation uh, for all of the buildings. And the thought is, particularly in the senior housing component of this project, to have one outlet within the apartment that will remain powered, even in the case of a total blackout, uh, and have rooms throughout the building uh, with cooling and heating, depending on the season, that would be available to seniors that don't leave uh, during an evacuation. Uh, and other emergency services, including one elevator per building in the high-rise component, will also be powered by the generator. Okay. Uh, who's responsible for maintaining the private street network? Uh, we are. It's part of the restrictive declaration that we signed with city, uh, city council, city planning. Um, but that was, uh, that's our expectation is as ownership, we would be expected to maintain that. Okay. And my last question before I turn it over. The community board and the borough president both raised uh, questions about the height and density. Uh, how do you respond to their concerns? We took them under consideration. We still maintain and believe that the program we're putting forth um, is what will allow us to provide the maximum community benefits. Great. Thank you. Uh, I want to turn it over now to Councilmember Richards. Yeah. Thank you, Chair Moya. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted you to go through the AMIs again. Um, so let's start there. Sure, so this is the slide that shows the um, AMI by building. Um, but we're, we've designed the 11 buildings to conform with um, various HPD programs that are, are currently available. Um, and so what we have is the first four buildings uh, A1, A2, B1, B2, which are the four buildings fronting on Beach Channel Drive, um, would fall under HPD's ELLA program. Um, and those are a range of AMIs between 30 and 80 percent. Um, the C1 and D1 block are um, what HPD has as kind of a hybrid um, uh, ELLA program where 80 percent of the building is under Ella and, and the other 20% um, is above. And so, um, so that's building C1 and D1. C2 is under HPD's mix and match program, um, which goes from 30 to 130% of AMI. 
And then uh, D2 and F1 are both senior housing buildings, um, which uh, fall under the HPD SARA program. Right, and can you just talk about phasing a little bit? So how many phases sure. do you anticipate? Yeah, we have a, so in the exhibit, there's a, there's a phasing chart. Um, and it does a good job of showing um, the, the phasing from north to south, really. And so what phase one is A1 and B1, which are the buildings fronting along um, Beach Channel Drive. And A1 is the one that's going to include the supermarket. Um, and B1 has what we're calling a junior anchor um, retail, um, you know, along Beach Channel Drive. Um, we'll then essentially complete that block with A2 and B2. Um, and, um, and, and that'll be phase two. Um, this also corresponds with the infrastructure improvements that are going on in Rockaway Beach Boulevard right now, um, where the DEP is installing um, new sewers, uh, which will make the viability of the C, D, and E blocks um, feasible. And so once we complete uh, A1 and B1, um, per you know, some discussions that we've been having, um, the D block is where we're designing to house the um, community center, and we're looking at now moving that up to phase three. Um, so that's shown as phase three in the red, um, followed by the E block uh, on phase four, and finally the, um, the C and F blocks on, on the last phase. And can you just go through, so what have the conversations with HPD been around um, when it comes to financing all of these phases? How many phases have they committed to financing so far? Well, they haven't committed to anything yet because um, that happens really post um, ULERT process. But once, once we're done with the ULERT process, um, we will work with HPD on getting into the pipeline and um, aggressively working towards breaking ground at some point next year. And do you anticipate any of these numbers to change, um, which is a hard question to ask, obviously, but speaking to HPD, have you got any um, uh, commitments on, you've gotten commitments on first phase and second phase already or no? Not timing yet, but it, okay. it's in, it, we've met with HPD over the past three years and we've worked with um, their planning department and Paris Strotter who um, has been at many of our um, uh, public meetings on the process and they're well, well aware of the project and um, you know, we expect to work with them over the next coming years to get this thing built. And uh, let's go to local hiring quick. So can you talk about uh, your commitment to good jobs? Um, and also, you know, one of the things we've spoken about is a 50% local hiring commitment. Um, so I want to know if we have that agreement. And uh, are you committed to working with local organizations uh, to ensure that the pipeline to these job opportunities are there for local community residents? and also a reporting mechanism to ensure that you're reporting back to the city council person's office and the local community board quarterly on what hires look like um, on this project. So we, we've you know, worked in your district before um, local hiring and had um, very good success on our Beach Channel Drive project, um, meeting the goals that, that we had discussed beforehand. Um, we anticipate um, working here with local organizations, in this case because of the size of the project, probably multiple local organizations, um, in order to ensure that um, we meet a local hiring target that we all agree on. Can you speak to your commitment to good jobs? We are committed to providing good jobs and to working with local organizations to make sure they go to local residents. Um, can you speak to, so in the EIS, uh, there were, uh, it was recognized that there would be sig significant adverse impacts on public elementary and intermediate schools, as well as publicly funded child care centers. Can you speak to what mitigations you're considering to address these impacts? Sure, so um, the FEIS that was published actually um, provides 
a range of mitigation options and also um, which, which include either providing land, um, which the developers are, are considering for a new school if, if working with SEA, it's determined that it's an appropriate location. Uh, also um, providing up to corn shell for, on the build out of a, a new school. And then lastly um, is the option of, of providing a, a payment. And which location uh, is being considered? It's the F block. F one, F one. Yeah, F one. Okay. All righty. I look forward to having much more serious conversations on that as we move along. Um, can you speak to? So there obviously are going to be some adverse impact uh, in, impacts on active open space. Can you speak to your mitigation um, plans on uh, the lack there of open space in this plan? Sure. So also on in the FEIS, the uh, mitigation which. The, the open space impact for this project occurs uh, in the third phase of development, and at that point we will, before that point, we will be engaging with Department of Parks and Recreation to either identify additional space within the study area for active open space, or it's been um, requested that we um, help to renovate the active basketball courts, rocket ball courts at Rockaway Community Park. Can, and I still don't think that's enough, quite frankly. So can you just speak to uh, your commitment to a community center as well? And uh, where are we at with that? Sure. Yeah, so um, we've understood all along that that was a top priority. Um, and a real need in the in in the neighborhood, and so we've been working with Ari's team. Um, you know, because of the nature of the large scale plan, we're we're confined in the locations where we can move things around within the site plan. But building the the D block because it's a C shape um, has a, a large open area in the center that has nothing above it, and so we have unlimited ability to to play with heights there and do things in that block. And so we've been um, working over the past month on designing a, a community center. Um, and we are uh, definitely committed to providing it as part of the project. And after the hearing, um, we'll be sharing you know, our vision for it with you. Right, and I, I would also request that we do a community visioning session um, so that you can hear specifically from the community what are some of the things they would like to see as well. Sure. Uh, um, what is the plan to combat ad adverse impacts related to hazardous materials, station stationary air quality, and noise during construction? In the EIS, the construction of a proposed project will result in the potential for significant adverse construction-related impacts uh, related to traffic, pedestrian, and noise during peak construction periods. And I do have concerns with uh, public housing residents directly adjacent to the site. So you can just speak to some of the mitigation um, plans you have to address this issue. Sorry. So uh, we, we recognize that there will be construction related impacts as a result of the project and um, as part of the restrictive declaration for the project, we've committed to a number of project components related to the environment, specifically on noise and air quality, um, which we can provide a detailed an analysis with all the equipment um, that we're proposing and different measures, including taller construction fences in certain areas um, related to construction traffic. Before we, will, we can pull a building permit, we have to re-engage with DOT and have a full um, construction plan in place that's fully vetted through them. Um, that that will analyze the construction traffic for each phase of the development, and um, I think w does that yeah. fully. Yeah, I mean that's that's fine for okay. now, and I just I'm very concerned about dust. So making sure we have water trucks to decompress some of the dust would be something that we look to hear more about as we move forward. Let's stay on transportation for a second. So we obviously know there will be. Um, significant impacts with 2,200 units coming online. Um, 
There are a number of proposed mitigation strategies to manage traffic with the proposed development. Uh, have you and the Department of Transportation agreed on a phasing and funding strategy uh, for implementation? So they fully reviewed our construction transportation plan and the proposed mitigation and we will continue, we will engage with them again because they, uh, often these traffic analyses require further analyses at the point that you're going to be implementing them. So it, it's a, it will be a, a constant collaborative um, relationship in terms of that. And you are aware that the Department of Transportation did do an Edgemere study, which is completed, I believe, um, and I think funding obviously has to be attached to some of the mitigation um, in, uh, initiatives that they are proposing. So we look forward to hearing a lot more about that. Um, so healthcare, obviously, this site used to be an old hospital, and healthcare remains to be a top priority for us, but also. Um, a big issue for local residents. Uh, I know we uh, initially had some conversations with the Health and Hospitals Corporation. Uh, can you just speak to uh, what have been some of their thoughts? Um, what is your plan to address some of the healthcare needs on sure. the peninsula? Sure, I mean, we, we've had a number of conversations with, with various um, sides of the healthcare industry, um, specifically HHC. Um, I met with them a couple weeks ago. Um, they expressed an interest in, a strong interest in being um, a part of this project. Um, they also expressed a reservation, not about capital funding, but about operational long-term funding for, um, uh, for the personnel that would be there. Um, and so I'm flagging that as, as you know, a follow-up on their side. Um, but they, they're most certainly interested in, in being in this location. Um, additionally, we've met with uh, Adabo Health Center, um, as well as um, PDCD, who provides funding to them um, in order to, to um, get their new developments going. But Adabo also um, was very interested uh, more in being in one of the latter phases on um, Rockaway Beach Boulevard. Um, they feel they already have a presence on Beach Channel Drive, but would like a presence on, on Rockaway Beach Boulevard. Um, so we're planning on continuing dialogue with them. Go through your commercial. So obviously this, this area, Edgemere, is severely under-retailed. And as a former resident of, uh, resident of, Ar of Ocean Village, now Arvern View, um, you know, there's nothing there. <laughs> Uh, there's no supermarket, there's no um, destination retail nor neighborhood retail. Can you speak to what your strategy is to address um, the severe uh, under-retailed area of Edgemere? Yeah, I mean, that, that's at the heart of our plan. Um, and, you know, we think having the supermarket as an anchor tenant is, is a huge advantage, especially the fact that they're um, already committed before we even put a shovel in the ground to being part of a project. Um, Who's the operator? Western Beef. Okay. Um, typically, um, you build a building, you design a commercial space, and then you hope to rent it. Um, and that's the general MO, you know, th throughout the city. Um, so we feel very fortunate that we have an anchor tenant willing to be, willing to be part of the project. Um, and we think that'll help us um, attract additional tenants. The, the, the goal is really to have them on Beach Channel Drive, the other, the other block on Beach Channel Drive to, to attract um, another anchor tenant there, and then the balance to be local retail um, to, to help uplift uh, folks in the Rockaways. Um, we've had a lot of interest from food businesses, um, to expand and be, be a part of this development. And we think, um, we think having a food theme to the retail here would be a really, um, a really attractive thing for the neighborhood. So you're talking of a food business incubator? We're talking about a food incubator. We're talking about trying to create a food hall, um, you know, a, alongside that, as well as, um, as, well as creating 
um, just restaurants. You know, one of the things we spent a lot of time at Ocean Bay um, with some of the resident leaders there uh, because they're really our most direct neighbor. And one of the things I always heard from them is that there's nowhere to just go sit down and have dinner with your family. Um, and so that's something we want to bring to this development. Uh, speak to libraries. So libraries will be impacted as the population increases, although not as impacted as our schools. What can be done to mitigate some of these concerns? I know we have some money that we set aside with the borough president to um, begin expanding Auburn Library, but with yeah, we're we're, we're open units. to looking at okay. spaces within the development. Um, in some of the work that Ari's been doing in, in, you know, just sketching out some potential uses in the community center, you know, we have some lower level area with um, that, that we thought might be, uh, might be usable as library space. And so um, we look forward to sharing that design with you. Right. And just, and I just want to go back to commercial again. So can you, I just want to push you a little bit more. So we know the supermarket is coming. What other anchor tenants are you thinking about? Or are there any other substantial conversations happening? And I know you have to normally build out the frame before. Yeah. I mean, frankly, it's too early. Um, you know, we don't, we don't have any potential anchor tenant for the other block at this point. Um, you know, I, I think, we we feel very fortunate to have the supermarket at this point, but um, that'll that'll be ongoing as we as we get under construction. And speak to uh, childcare seats. So obviously there'll be a, a need for um, more childcare facilities in this plan. What is, what are you doing around that? Sure, um, we have significant community facility space within the development, and we certainly believe that one of those spaces could be. Um, set aside for child care. Uh, we have uh, successful daycare operations in a, a number of our apartment buildings throughout the city and um, have actually had some users in the Rockaways express interest uh, in, in being here and in our senior building. So, um, Go back through your, your, your energy plan again. So will there be solar on the roof? Are we expecting green roofs? Can you just go through a little bit more can talk about your that. resiliency plan? So, and what features, you know, I'm, I know obviously we've done some zoning changes here that will require you to build higher. Can you just speak a little bit more to uh, around your strategy on resiliency and sustainability? So just by virtue of the fact that all of the buildings will be affordable housing, they're going to have to comply at a baseline with the Enterprise Green Communities Program. Uh, we are trending right now, at least in my office, to opt for um, certifying buildings as LEED Gold. It seems that there's very little difference between the two as the code, as the energy code has changed, or there will be very little difference. So while we haven't discussed actual um, commissioning, we're going to be designing to standards very close to lead gold. Uh, solar panels have been on every new construction building I've designed with the Arkers for the past five years, more, more than five years. They put so, uh, solar arrays on every building. Uh, we've also done a lot of work with them with cogeneration plants, which means that you can use natural gas when available. Uh, to heat water for the building and use the waste heat to run generators and generate electricity within the building. So that's also an option here. And then as the phasing, it, it is a 10 year plus plan. So whatever is available at the time that we get to a particular phase, we'll look for the most innovative, uh, innovative on-site generation that we could possibly provide. Uh, but from a sustainability perspective and energy consumption, uh, all appliances are gonna be Energy Star. We're gonna have high performance windows and facade systems, high performance roofs, green roofs where we can, where it doesn't interfere with the solar arrays. And of course, the solar, um, the water consumption is going to be mitigated with uh, low flow fixtures and on-site storage of rainwater. OK, great. I look forward to uh, hearing more about that. And then uh, my last question is, and I, I want you to elaborate. Obviously, there was an article uh, this morning on your partnership with NEPCO. Sure. Uh, and I wanted you to touch a little bit more on that because you know, management and and obviously the quality of life of anything happening in my district. We want it to be the gold standard. Um, we don't want to go back to those dark days and where yep. development was happening in the Rockaways. And we had a, a culmination of all these problems which drove 
um, crime and other things to happen in the neighborhood. So what is gonna be different? Uh, what is the management structure gonna look like in this building uh, as we move forward? Sure, so they, they were a HDFC partner on the project um, from at, at the very beginning. Um, and that was because at the time they were expected to be a social service provider on our Beach Channel Senior Project uh, because we were coming off a project in Richmond Hill where they are still successfully just providing social services to our seniors there and do a great job of it. Um, we were made aware of some of these issues um, back in 2017 and as you know we changed the social service provider at Beach Channel to JASA um, since then. Um, and they will, they don't and have no future role in this project. So, no future? No. And can you just speak to what will the management look like? Who will manage? Yeah, so we own, operate, manage, self-manage all of our own properties, um, and we will be the management company here. All righty. Well, I want to thank you um, for your your tenacity in working with the local community, which has really been something that we've done, uh, I think even prior to this project. And, and one of the things I, I said very early on when we did the first project is that we're gonna judge you based on your history um, at this at the, uh, the first, se the senior building, the Sarah building we did. And I wanna say you did keep all your commitments. Thank you. Um, which, which were really good and you did go above and beyond the call of duty. We, we expect the same here. Um, and I believe the affordability is, is nicely balanced here. Um, I think we need to flush out a lot more around the community center. Um, obviously, the job opportunities, there's still a lot more to flush out around um, the school and other things. So we're just looking for substantial, concrete investments before uh, we're ready to sign our name on to this specific project, which will have an impact on this community for centuries, right? You know, we're, we're really changing the face of Edgemere with a, a project like this. And once again, as a former resident here, um, I'm very happy to see something is finally happening in this community, but we wanna make sure that it's responsible development and that we are adding all of the amenities for a community that's been sorely left behind even prior to Sandy. So we look forward to continued conversations and I wanna thank you for coming out. Thank you for having us. Thank you for your testimony today. Uh, I'd like to call up the next panel uh, to Tamira Jacobs, Milan Taylor, John Clausman, and uh, always good to see a, a familiar face and uh, a, a pastor from my district, uh, Reverend uh, Patrick Young. Tamara Jacobs, yep. Milan Taylor, John Clausman, <coughs> Reverend Young, okay. uh, Reverend uh, Evan Gray, Reverend Gilbert Pickett. Reverend Gray, you, yeah, please, and Reverend Pickett, yep, you can all just take a seat, yep, you, right there. And we'll start with uh, with Reverend Pickett right here, just to just state your name, and then you can begin your testimony. Just Good make morning. sure you push the button that turns on your microphone. Make sure that the light is on. Yep. Good morning, Mr. Chair. My name is Reverend Donnell Peterson. I'm here reading on behalf of Gilbert Pickett, Reverend Pickett. My name is Reverend Gilbert 
and I am the pastor of Mount Horeb Baptist Church, Baptist Church in Corona, and the moderator of the Eastern Baptist Association, representing 107 churches in Queens with a significant number in the Rockaways. We are in favor of the redevelopment of the Peninsula Hospital Project. This proposed new mixed use campus will provide much needing, needed housing, job opportunities, new business development, and healthy food options for the residents on the peninsula. The redevelopment proposal will create new life for the neighborhood. The developer has committed to working with 32BJ, SEIU, to ensure that good paying jobs will be available for building service, service workers. These opportunities in housing and employment benefit the lives of all residents of Queens. I therefore fully support the proposed redevelopment and request that it be approved respectfully. Reverend Gilbert Pickett, Senior Pastor Moderator of Mount Horeb Baptist Church. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Tamara Jacobs. I am the Director of Operations for the Rockaway Youth Task Force. Um, I'm also a resident of the Rockaway Peninsula and also a community board member as well. Um, the Rockaways is a racially segregated and racially and economically segregated community. Um, the black and brown um, communities on the eastern end of the Rockaway Peninsula has historically been underfunded and under-resourced, um, like uh, Donovan Richards said earlier. Um, we deserve resources and services necessary to live comfortably. Uh, we deserve housing um, that is affordable and allows for upward mobility. Um, this project not only brings affordable housing, but also jobs, recreational community um, centers, um, restaurants, and much more. Um, resources and amenities that we don't currently have on the peninsula. Um, we deserve a community that is vibrant and sustainable. Um, at the June community board meeting, we heard from 40 uh, Rockaway residents who um, were in support of the project and less than five um, were against. Unfortunately, the community board did uh, support, did um, vote, um, their, uh, sorry, their vote did not reflect the community's um, voice. Um, it is important and necessary that the individuals directly impacted by the redevelopment of the Peninsula Hospital site um, be a part of the conversation and have a seat at the table. Um, without the intentional involvement of these individuals, the project will fail to benefit the media community. Um, I do ask that all of you um, do uh, vote in support of the Edgemere Commerce Redevelopment Project um, as the community has expressed an overwhelming need for this development. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair and Council Member. Um, my name is Reverend Patrick H. Young, pa Senior Pastor of First Baptist Church of East Elmers, also a General Secretary of IMPACT. But I'm writing and express uh, support, my support particularly, for this development, which would, in the words of Councilman Richards, responsible development is occurring in Peninsula Hospital campus. Uh, I believe that this project would be a life-changing project for those people of community in that community. And there are people here, 25 members of the Queens community are here in uh, black and orange shirt to uh, yield in their support to this effort as well as this development will open up opportunities of a 20,000 square foot uh, supermarket, which is desperately needed in that community, as well as mixed use housing, uh, mixed use income housing for that community, which will allow a lot of people to be a, a part of that housing development, playgrounds for children, as well as community and retail space. Uh, much, more overly, it will create good jobs a good paying jobs to allow people from the community to share in uh, employment for this project. Also, it's, it's wonderfully supported by 32BJ, SEIU, who are here this, this afternoon as well. Uh, I encourage this project, and I look forward uh, that this project go forward, and I encourage that, um, that this project be approved, and I fully support the rezoning for this project. Thank you. Thank you. My name is the Reverend Evan D. Gray, Sr., pastor of the Macedonia Baptist Church in Fall Rockaway and the president of the National Action Network Fall Rockaway chapter. I've grown up in the Rockaway community uh, the majority of my life. I've served there at the Macedonia Baptist Church for 27 years. 
I am a product of Hamel Housing, public housing that is in the area. I've seen the highs and the lows of the Far Rockaway community. This project will breathe life into a desolated area that has no supermarket, that is wasteful land sitting idly. It would also give opportunity for those who are living in public housing to have the opportunity of moving out of public housing and being a part of this affordable housing project. This is wonderful for our community and it will make our community a much more desirable place to live and to stay. Because of market rate housing in our community, it has become increasingly hard for those who live in the Far Rockaway area to stay there. I fully support this project. I believe it was well thought of and it has received plenty of community input from those who live nearest to the project. I do see that this project will be something that will be beautiful, will beautify the surrounding area and I believe from from the people whom I've spoke to near the project that they are looking forward for this great project to be in our community. It is wonderful that they will finally have a supermarket, which seems minuscule, but when you have had no supermarket for a great number of years, this is a great benefit for our community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your testimony today. I'd like to call up uh, the next panel. Uh, Omar, just one name, Omar. Charles. Bruce. And uh, Glenn uh, DeResto. Glenn DeResto? No? Yeah. yeah? Okay. Omar, we're going to. And if you can just state your name, you, you may begin. Yes, uh, my name is Omar Lopez. I'm a community and uh, union organizer for Local Union 361. Uh, we've been uh, talking to the developer so far, so good. So hopefully um, something's going to come in place to uh, not only to our local union, but also to our local uh, residents from uh, the, uh, they live in the Rockaways. Uh, we believe this project will help the community, especially the youth through the apprenticeship program uh, in behalf of our local union. A project of this magnitude is almost 10 years. It's going to be broken bones, broken backs, and probably death. So one of the things that are uh, actually, in our behalf, we're asking is for this project to be safe because it's getting old to see the newspaper and work is getting killed every other week. And that's one part of our concern. But so hopefully, this job is going to be uh, on the hands of a uh, proper uh, um, um, contractor who's going to be able to take care of the workers and keep this project safe. And that's the only thing we're asking for also. But also we pro for the project. Thank you. No. No without commitment. My name is Charles Lind. I'm a resident of Queens. Um, I'm also a, a local 361 iron worker. I have two major concerns with this project. One, on behalf of unions in general, you know, union jobs mean safety. Construction is innately dangerous. Let's keep our workers safe. Let's, ha let's hire highly trained workers. It's nice to say that we want to hire local people. That is, that's an honorable goal. But I think the local community is selling itself short yeah. and not demanding more. 
by saying local workers, the local workers to just say that they're gonna go union with maintenance jobs yeah. or with food service jobs at best. I think that's selling the local community short and I would like to see better. Yeah. I would expect better. I think unions that offer apprenticeship programs offer people in the local community the opportunity to learn a skill or a trade that they can use throughout their entire lives to benefit them and their families. The unions also help provide job security for those workers while allowing them to earn a marketable skill that they could take with them anywhere throughout the United States or even into another country. These people now have a skill. People have a skill. They'll feel better about themselves. Again, they're not just pushing a broom for a maintenance job. The, the building, the jobs that are involved with building the, the, actual, the actual establishments and the buildings, those are highly skilled jobs that could allow local residents the ability to learn a skill that will really drive them up out of poverty. And it will allow them to retire better and raise families better in Queens and in the Rockaways. But I, I'm also concerned about, as a Queens resident, about parking. We, we gotta wrap it up. We have two minutes for every panelist. Okay, I, I'm concerned about parking. I'm also, I also wanna ask you, council member, you, you want another store to, uh, another big store to help you know, support there. But think about it, if you're engaging in more low income housing, which there's always a need for, Charles, but we I, all I, know- I have to move it along. Uh, Your two minutes yeah. Yeah. Are, are up, so we have other panelists and we okay, have a long I, I line, so a more. I, if you can wrap it up now, great. Yeah. If not, I'm gonna have to cut you off and we okay. have to go to the next panelist. The Rockaways are already unfortunately seen as a blight on much of, the, on much of Queens as a dumping ground. It's sad to say. Okay, we Charles, all know why th it's thank changed Thank you, thank you for community. your testimony. Thank you for your testimony today. What store uh, is gonna move in there? We're gonna have to I'm cut saying. you off. What store do you think That's you it. wanna We're gonna have in? to cut you off. Yeah. Thank let, you. Let me correct you. Rockway is actually the eastern and has a, one of the lowest um, uh, um, uh, commercial um, vacancy rates in the city. So you should know the facts before you speak about my district yeah. in that way. Thank you. Well, we'll see what store moves Bruce, in there. You're up next. Yeah. Hello, hello, every hello I'm everybody. Remind everyone to please keep it to two minutes or else you're gonna get cut off. Bruce Jacobs, Coalition of Rockaways, fighter for the Rockaways in Southeast Queens and all of New York City. 30 years New York City Transit, 9-11 first responder, and a resident of Edgemere. My talk, I work, and thank you, Donovan Richards, I try to work with you. The, everybody puts in that it's black and brown. Let me tell you something, I lived in Edgemere for a long time. Edgemere is all different people. It's not just one people. It's all different people. The girl said brown and black. No, it's not all brown and black. There's all different people in our neighborhood, and we want represented. Also, like the man said, we're selling ourselves short. We want real stores, real activities. You say a supermarket, we have a supermarket. We have an Ocean Bay, a supermarket. We have Stop and Shop. We have Dirty Second Street. A supermarket ain't doing nothing for the neighborhood. That's nothing. There's no commitments to jobs. We want union apprentice jobs. And to Dirty 2 BJ, which we support, we want you guys to understand that one job is not, they need 10 jobs. A lot of affordable housing, and also another point, these guys who grew up in the, in the projects, they got married, they got a job. They, uh, they ended up marrying each other. Their grandparents live in the projects. They want to come back to Rockaway. Under this plan, with this affordable housing, there's not enough, they don't make enough money, they can't get in there. They make too much money. Their grandparents want them back in the neighborhood. They would help the neighborhood. And the thing is, under these rules, they can't get in the neighborhood. They grew up in the Rockaways. Just because you have a job don't mean you have money. 
You have children, you have expenses. They came from my neighborhood. They deserve to be able to come back to my neighborhood. The community board voted against it. Everybody acts like, oh, you know, I want development in my neighborhood, but they act like it's nothing that the community board voted against it. Density, too many people. If it's a 10-year program, why do you need 2,200? Why can't you be satisfied with 15? We want insurances, but, you know, I want development, but the right development. Thank you. Thank you. Glenn? <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Glenn DeResto. I'm a lifelong resident of the Rockaway community and a stakeholder. My family goes back in the community four generations, over 100 years. I have deep concerns about the current plan with regards to its density and lack of units for two-income households. These are not just my concerns. These are the concerns of many across the entire peninsula, including uh, Community Board 14, who voted it down by a vote of 28 to 5, Queensborough President, who made significant recommendations, and also Commissioner Knuckles from City Planning Commission. None of us are opposed to the redevelopment of Peninsula Hospital site, affordable housing, or the ARCA companies. These people are all concerned not only because of the density or the lack of units available for two-income families, they are also concerned because many of the significant adverse impacts laid out in the final environmental impact statement. During the study, the city planning stated the area suffers from high concentrations of poverty, public and publicly subsidized housing, as well as long-term care facilities. New York City also stated in the past Half of the subsidized housing in Queens was located on the Rockaway Peninsula and construction of additional low and moderate income housing would only increase that proportion. These are not my words. These are the words of New York City planning. Building 2,200 units and providing only 13% for moderate and middle income families is also not the answer. Not providing affordable housing, home ownership is also not part of the plan, which it should be. We have a wonderful opportunity to do something special while providing affordable housing to people who need it, improving a community, and bridging an economic gap that has played the Rockaways for half a century. Our local councilman here himself has stated publicly he does not support the project as it stands. I'm excited to see what the future holds, but adjustments to the plan need to be made to ensure the long-term vitality of the neighborhood and the development the people of the Rockaways deserve better. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. and I'd like to now call up the next panel. Uh, Yanni Hernandez, Steve Perez, and Eddie George. No, Eddie George? No. Hi, Yenny. We'll start with you, Yenny. Um, good morning, Chair Moya, member, the, um, council members. My name is Jenny Hernandez. I have been a member of 32BJ for 13 years. I am speaking today on behalf of my union to express our support for the proposed project. At Merck Cutman, we represent over 600 members who live and work in Far Rockaway. Many of our old member cleans and maintaining residential projects like the one under your consideration today. We believe the rezoning is an important example of responsible development and a model for how affordable housing and good permanent job can be created together. We are proud to support it. The 2,200 unit of affordable housing that are proposed will transform the vacant hospital sign into, into a resource for the community. We full support Archer Company in their proposal to generate as much affordable housing density as possible, 22200 unit of affordable housing is unprecedented in this area and illustrate the 
the developer's commitment to this community. The east side of Farrokaway need new housing and commercial space that will re-need that community. And this project will do just that. In addition, we are excited to share that the development team has made a commitment to provide prevailing wage building service job once the project is complete. A development of this site will create many new jobs at the development teams. Guarantee means that I will be a source of economy, opportunity, and mobility for local residents over the long term. I know firsthand how making the prevailing wage can change your life. It is, thank you. Oh, it is a relief to be able to support my family and keep up with the raising costs of the city. I have affordable health care I can count on and access to a secure reti retirement. And additionally, because of my union, I have access to a state the art training facilities that give me the opportunity to earn certification for progress my career. Residents of the Rockaways and Edmar need a deserved opportunity like this. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman. My name is Steven Perez. I'm from Local 46, Iron Workers. Um, I would like to thank the representatives from the ARCA companies for coming down to give their presentation. I have heard the agreement with Local 32 BJ mentioned again and again, and I would like to commend you for that, for hiring union labor on the project. <clears throat> Where my concerns come in is I have not heard of any agreement with the New York City Building Trades for the actual construction of the project. I was wondering if you are aware of the organizations such as Construction Skills, Pathways to Apprenticeship, Helmets to Hard Hats, where we actually hire local residents from that community for that project and put them into the unions where we provide them with a career, not just a job for the one project. You know, you speak uh, over and over again about local hire. I have heard nothing about wages. I mean, are we referring to the local hire model where local residents get exploited by unscrupulous contractors? where they get put on a job, where the rates are well below prevailing wage, where they, they uh, acquire no training of a particular skill, and most importantly, they receive no safety training. So, and then when that one project is over, the local hire residents again become unemployed. So those are my concerns. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you for your testimony today. Uh, I'd like to call up the last panel, uh, Eugene uh, Kalik. 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 Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I thought it was a K. Uh, and then Shay Zigwe. Begin. Greetings to the public. Greetings, Council. My name is Chairdu Shay Uzigwe, community, act, community activist in Southeast Queens. Since the start of 2019, I have joined forces with several unions, inviting them to Far Rockaway to host pre apprenticeship workshops in public housing for men and women in the Rockaways in an attempt to prepare Rockaway residents for the vast amount of construction opportunities in the pipeline for Far Rockaway and other parts of Southeast Queens. The proposed site located along Beach 53rd Street and Beach Channel, and Beach Channel Drive will soon transform into a mixed use affordable housing complex with amenities in Far Rockaway, creates an opportunity for ARCA to partner and fully support union workers. Many, as you can see, are in attendance today. This partnership can lay the foundation for sustainable employment opportunities for Rockaway residents. The consensus is clear. 
that the residents in Far Rockaway want Arker companies to build, but build smart, respecting the, the public's concerns regarding density, regarding infrastructure, and overcrowded schools. I hope that as, as we continue to discuss the future of Peninsula Hospital, we can reach a common ground that elected officials, union members, and community leaders, as well as Arker companies, can respect. Thank you. Thank you. Eugene. My name is Gene Fallick. I'm only a third generation Rockaway resident. Um, it's interesting to hear how beautifully the Arca companies lie. They have community involvement. They were invited to the Bayswater Civic Association, but they weren't sure that we were in favor, so they said no. HPD, in their resilient Edgemere study, recommended against high-rise development in this area. They said we certainly need stores, and that's true, but not high-rise. If we're going to have 19-story buildings, why not 100-story buildings? The Orker's own consultant, former DOT Commissioner Sam Schwartz, said that there will be severe traffic impacts even if DOT does everything that they recommend from one end of Rockaway to the other. People will die because of the traffic problems. They say that the development, <clears throat> excuse me, is for police and firefighters and teachers, but a married couple with five years on the job in any of those fields would not be eligible for any of their apartments. The community board voted overwhelmingly, five to one, against the project, as stated. The ARCA companies you've heard today said, well, we'll look at this, we'll look at that. They have not made any commitments to fix the very many adverse impacts. I urge you to turn the project down as it is currently stated. They want to build more than four times the number of, pro of apartments that they can build as of right. Twice the number they could build might be reasonable. More than four times, absolutely unreasonable. Thank you. Thank you. So, thank you very much for your testimony today. Uh, are there any other members of the public they wish to testify on this uh, item. Yeah. Can you please fill out? Anna Palmer, just please state your name and you can begin. If you can just uh, turn on the microphone. Good afternoon, my name is Anna Palmer. Uh, thank you City Council for letting us speak in regard to the development of the Peninsula Hospital site. I think uh, a few things were left out being that there is also another project being developed on Mont Avenue, which is going to impact how many people are in the area of Mont Avenue. That is a major shopping area for Rockway besides Five Town, which the businesses have been going out of business. If you have all the people that from the new development over by Mont Avenue, then it is not enough stores or resources for the people in the other part of Rockaway. So as you build up downtown Rockaway, that leaves out many other people in Edgemere and Auburn. As Bruce mentioned, this stop and shop, but that is like over 15 blocks away from the 40s. 
You have to have a cab or a vehicle to shop and stop and shop. It is a food desert. So you have the people in the middle, which is the 40s to the 60s, and then you would have overcrowding when that new building comes up in downtown Rockaway. So it is necessary to have that development built to accommodate the people that are in the middle of the peninsula. Yes, the other end is taken care of. They have key food, they have stop and shop, but the people in the middle, they don't. So we have to look at all the residents and accommodate them. Um, ARCA cannot make promises that they can't keep. I respect that. They're not lying to us saying we can do this and we can do that. They're not sure, so they're not putting and saying they can do what they can't do. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public that wish to testify? Seeing none, uh, Councilmember Richards. Well, I want to. Cool. I want to thank every. I want to first thank you, Chair, for uh, your patience and certainly hearing out the public. And uh, I want to reassure everyone that we are going to work very hard over the course of the next few weeks to drive home a plan uh, that certainly reflects the needs of the Edgemere community. Once again, as someone who lived there, you know, I don't need to be dictated on what the shortages uh, are there. And we're going to make sure that we have a plan that fully. Um, complements the needs of the Edgemere community. So I want to thank everybody for coming out. Look forward to working with the ARCAs and the administration over the course of the next 45 days to ensure that we come up with a plan that is great for Edgemere. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Richards. And before we conclude this meeting, would Council please announce the results of today's votes? I have a, a vote of six in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions. The items are approved and referred to the full land use committee. This concludes today's meeting, and I would like to thank the members of the public, my colleagues, and of course uh, the council and land use staff uh, for attending. Uh, this meeting is uh, hereby adjourned. <laughs>